preseason game number three, the final dress rehearsal before we head towards the Tuesday 53-man roster breakdown. And then I all of a sudden realize there's a lot more to figure out for Big Blue than you might want. Let's get into it next. Yo ho, my friends! It is OGP, the One Giant Podcast, on a Friday, where of course we are your host Adam Armbrecht over here, breaking down the Brooklyn Nets and the Locked On Nets podcast, and yonder there, the healthy, wealthy, and wise, the seasoned generational ticket holder, Mister Andrew Makowitz. Uh, Adam, I'm I'm excited for this weekend. Not only do we have the last preseason game, uh, but my college roommate, shout out Jay Barton, getting married tomorrow. Should be a good day. It's going to be like 85 degrees. Beautiful. The cocktails will be flowing. I am just excited to get into the weekend, my friend. Big J. Big J, as we used to call him back in the day. Never met the man, but I'm sure it's going to be a great time. Congratulations to him. Big for the podcast. I heard they will be piping in this episode during the ceremony. Now, on the Giants side of things, though, we, we talked about how it, it's going to be, obviously, the final preseason game. Um, there's a lot of sense, and we're going to get into it, about who is or is not going to be playing in this game for the Giants, given just what feels like the slew of injuries that they've had. But before we tap into that and to what maybe our expectations are around this game before we get to that big Tuesday date, the 53-man cut, uh, a couple of roster moves got made here ahead of the weekend to clear a couple of, uh, of options to guard on a kicker and also because... um. This team has problems, I think. <laughs> Go ahead and run, just run down the list of what got done here because I, they keep making these moves. And every time they do, somebody gets hurt, someone gets injured, somebody doesn't pass a physical, and we find ourselves right back at square one. Yeah. So they basically made three different roster moves. Um, interesting. Uh, the one noteworthy one of, of being released was Andrew Adams. Um, Interesting because he's really our only veteran in the secondary that has more than a couple of years of experience. So that came, kind of came to me as a surprise. They listen to, to the addition, show, buddy. They like where heads at youth. I, I know. Well, well, we'll we'll break into what each of them means in a second. The second one was Ryan Santoso, kicker, formerly of the Giants, um, back signed with the Giants. Obviously, we'll talk a little bit about Graham Cano and Travis Toivonen. Uh, an, a familiar name for Giant fans who's been in and out of the building on the practice squad, off the practice squad, brought back in again, presumably with the idea of Sunday reps in, in the preseason game in mind. Which which way do you want to go first in, in terms of those three transactions, Adam? Oh, well, the kicker, I mean, the kicker just because Gano got kicked in the head trying to make a tackle. So this is just to get somebody out there to bang some field goals for the final preseason game. That one doesn't matter to me. Um, the, the safety one is the most interesting. I don't even know why I bother talking about the kicker. Adams getting released is the most interesting. I think it's because they said, you know, Thompson special teams value as well. So they like, again, we've talked about this a lot. And I mean, this is all teams, not just the giants, the ability to do serve multiple purposes, especially if you're a depth piece on this roster. So you go forward now and you feel pretty good about not only the fact that you have that versatility behind them, but then Dane Belton, the reports are is that he's right around the corner, getting back out there on the field. So this gives me the sense that they're, pretty bullish that Dane Belton is going to be as close to, if not hundred percent ready to go week one. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious because that seems to be the indication that everyone's saying, Oh, Belton looks like he's going to be able to go. So, you know, the need for a backup veteran to be there is, is not necessary. Do you, Adam, do you feel at all though, that it could be that since Dane Belton's gone out, they've really, really liked what they've seen from Yusuf Corker and Trenton Thompson. Like, yeah. is it their play that maybe he's doing that? Not so much Dane Belton is going to be back in the room. Yeah, again, like, I mean, I know people like the idea when they brought back in Adams and he's a veteran, but I, he's all right. Like, he's not, he, he wasn't a great safety and he went down to Tampa and played on a really strong defense and that elevates your game. I had no problem bringing him in, although at the time, I, you know, small pat on my own back. I said, I, I don't know why you have him in here. You, you got use of Corker after the draft. You have Julian Love. You have Xavier McKinney. I understood about Dane Belton, but then you brought in Thompson. Like, that's the room. You don't need to have this. And if you believe in Wink Martindale, I think that you, as you mentioned, did they like enough they saw from Thompson and from use of Corker? Yeah, you can look at that skill set and say, this is what I always talk about with this regime, right? They bring in the players. So they see a young player that they can develop and grow with. 
So let's move forward with them. Why waste the reps this season on a veteran that you know for a fact we can debate other positions and other players? Adams was not a part of the long-term future for this team. So why waste valuable reps for young players to develop? Yeah, I I, I think I'm I'm slowly coming more towards your side of, of things too. Because what I hear from a lot of, of NFL people also, Adam, is like, there are just a lot of guys in the NFL. Like, they're, yeah. like Andrew Adams is, is, is a guy, and it's not disparaging. He's the top 001% of people that play football in the entire world. Like, he's great, but there are guys that fill back-end spots of a roster that in a pinch can fill in and take snaps, and there are guys that are difference makers or have upside of being a pro bowler or, or, or creating havoc or doing whatever, being above average. It's like, yeah. you know, when we go from 80 man rosters down to 53, we're going to lose some names and some faces of guys. You're like, Oh, I kind of wish that the giants found a way to keep him around. But like in actuality, every team is dealing with this. And some of these, some of these players are just guys, right? Like they're just people that fill out the back end of the roster and nothing more. I'm excited yeah. that they're saying undrafted Trenton Thompson, maybe Yusuf Corker, Dane Belton, all seem to have more upside. And as we think about the future of the Giants, that's a better situation for the Giants to be in. And I'll even give a tip of the cap to, I mean, we know Xavier McKinney and what he's meant to be for this team, but I'll give a tip of the cap to Julian Love. I think that that's a factor in it as well. He is a veteran. He does have experience. He's still younger, but he has the experience. And if Wink Martindale has liked what he's also put out there, not just from a leadership standpoint, but from, a, oh, I like to be able to use him here a little bit. I also think I can use him in this type of situation. As long as he's shown a little bit of that versatility too, that probably mitigates the need for another player, another piece to serve a purpose. I agree. And listen, the, the whole idea is some of these players that you're going to hear cut, we're either going to have hopes of bringing them back to the practice squad or they're yes, fringe guys yes. that, are, that are out of this. But Adam, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. We're going to lose. A, we're, we're losing a third of the players, basically, that you've been hearing about in training <laughs> yeah. camp over the next five days. And a lot of that, it could be just 27 injuries, guys, just 27 cut. of your closest personal friends are getting kicked out of the party. Yeah, just guys that you've <laughs> learned their name. You hear their backstory. You're trying to figure out like where they fit on this roster. 27 of those guys are either going to be moved to the practice squad or elsewhere because there's just not enough room when you break down the roster. I, I, yeah, we'll, we'll pause on that conversation because, as you say, the other piece of this is something that all teams are also dealing with right now, but it feels like the Giants can't stop dealing with it around players that we really think are going to be important. Aziz Ojolari narrowly missed. Like, it was, he went down in the joint practice and everyone went, oh, might have to get carted off, like could be a disaster. He narrowly avoids a catastrophe, which if he had gone down, and I know that it looked like Looks like Thibodeau has avoided the severity of that injury too, but we also know we lost Darian Beavers. It's like one more guy, one more young guy in that front seven core for the defensive unit. And I, I don't know what my reaction would have been. Like, it's like, you know, the, the, the can't have nice things or just the big step back of like, Hey, these are now guys that are key, you know, contributors. Like at a certain point, it doesn't matter who you bring in after that. You've lost the talent level that you cannot replace. Yeah, I mean, look, Aziz Ojolari was basically uh, helped off by two trainers. It looked really bad at the beginning. People have kind of taken a step back and saying it's not as bad as initially thought. We're still waiting for the full report of, like, what it is and what's going to happen. So, it, you know, while it, it could be not catastrophic, it still could be he's out for the first three weeks of the season. Like, we don't yeah. even know what, what it is yet. And, and, you know, you hear about that injury. Obviously, Thibodeau during the during the preseason game looked like it could have been bad. He dodged a bullet. But then you have Colin Johnson going down with an Achilles. You have the entire offensive line being decimated between Feliciano and Shane Lemieux yep. and, and Joshua Zudu. Like, there, there is just so many challenges that, that I – it made me think of this, Adam. Like, where is the balance between trying to get people reps – and trying to get a healthy roster, your best healthy roster available for week one. Yeah, this is the this is the thing that I have a hard time with because I know they talk about that. That's you know they cut them from four preseason games down to three, and then now they're already talking about they're going to go to two, and then they're going to get to eighteen game season because that's what the goal was for the NFL all along. And this feels wonky, and now you get joint practices, but like you have to play, right? Like you can't. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't do anything all off season and just walk into week one. And we've seen that already where like the start of the NFL season after you have less contact in the preseason and in training camps. Now, all of a sudden they say like, well, this is why things look a little bit sloppier the first week or two of the NFL season. And I, like, I'm OK with that being the case. But the reality is, is there's no guarantee of getting injured on a joint practice against the Jets or in week three of the season. So I, maybe it seems you know, like a bigger issue. 
but I don't think that anything is drastically different about you know, safeguarding players against injuries versus the reality of what the game is. That's what, that's what sport is. People get hurt. It's a violent sport. It, it but it doesn't it feel like let, for players that you know are going to be on the roster or players that are, are first team rep contributing guys like yes they need to get some some reps I guess but you know playing them in these yeah but wasn't games, it, yeah, it but wasn't feels... it but the, the joint practice wasn't it uh, Aziz Ojolari they stopped the joint practice and said ah you know like everyone's getting pretty beat up whatever and then Aziz went down doing sprints like that's kind of my point is like these things aren't happening like. So, where, like, where's the conditioning going to come in? Like, I, okay, you don't want to have the physical contact, Aziz, Thibodeau, you know, any of these guys. All right, fine. What, they're not going to be in shape. Like, you can't be in, in game day shape by just working out. It's like NBA. It's the same way with this. When you come back from an injury, the conditioning to be able to run up and down the court for 25, 30 minutes a night only comes by getting on the court and physically doing it, by and large. Like, most guys cannot just come back and walk out there and play like that. The, the issue is, <clears throat> as a Giant fan, it feels like the Giants have bad luck and people get hurt more than other teams. And when you actually look at the stats, the Giants do have the worst luck in the NFL. And it, it's it's such, a, such bad luck, Adam, that it's an outlier compared to every other team. The amount of injuries that the Giants have had, the amount of knee injuries, the amount of serious injuries... Uh, over the course of three different coaching staffs, over the course course uh, course of multiple training staff people being involved, over the course of regular grass at the practice facility, over the course of the turf at MetLife, the Giants just continue to get injured more yeah. than every other team. And it's like, what do you do? Like I I, I read Dan Duggan uh, had had asked John Mara a few questions about the turf and what they're doing, and you know. He basically said, oh, you know, it wasn't as bad last year as it had been for us. And that was a positive. And it's like, well, that's not really what I want to hear is the answer. But but it's just hard. You see all these players go down and getting, you know, quote unquote, practice reps or mean, you know, somewhat meaningless reps, you know, in a, in a group practice. And it's like, I just want our best players to be out there week one, not like, you know, worried about injuries and all these other things that are going on. Yeah, I get it. I again, like, I just think that if Aziz was going to get hurt, he was going to get hurt. By the way, he's a guy that fell a little bit in the draft because of an injury concern around him as well that afforded the Giants to be able to get him a little bit later than maybe his value was. So some guy, you know, some guys are, are more prone to be injured than others, right? I mean, Daniel Jones, who knock on wood hasn't hurt at all or had any issues this preseason, and quarterbacks simply don't with they're protected. But he's a guy that over the start of his career has just had injury issues. He just he has a hard time staying healthy, right? I, Eli Manning. It didn't matter whether or not he was normal training camps and everything else, right? He was just a guy that was built to be able to take a beating, crumple like a sack of potatoes, and pop back up. Like, that was just the type of player he was. And I think that that's what really all these things are. And they get heightened, to your point, because we're evaluating, we're trying to figure out the team, we're trying to get excited about the roster, and these injuries start to stack up. That being the case, um, another, I think, bigger conversation here, obviously, is, as, as we said at the top, is this 53 man roster and well and it does tie into to this to this conversation too. You're going into Sunday. There are a lot of, I think decisions that can get made here. I know you're going to make the case for there's only so many spots that are really viable and up for grabs here potentially. I tend to agree. But do we think we're seeing anybody on Sunday Giants? Do we think that anyone is going out on the field for the New York Football Giants with everything you just talked about and injury risks and concerns or is this going to be not even the B squad. This is going to be the D squad just to get through these reps. And the Giants and the coaching staff is going to make their evaluation based on what they saw in the first two games and what they've seen over the course of practices. And then what, you know, sitting around the office on Monday, on Monday, all the way until Tuesday and making hard calls. Yeah. I, I don't expect to see basically anyone from the first team. I do think you're obviously going to see some players that are going to be on the 53 man roster participate just be, sheer numbers game, it, right? right of like you know they, like <laughs> you can't sit everybody right like yeah. but but you know does daniel jones need to be out there with with the potential of someone rolling up on his leg like i, I don't really see the benefit at this point uh to, to seeing someone like him out there the, you know the question that we talk about more is is there anyone that's going to be out there that will this preseason game will make or break the final roster spot on whether they make it or not. You know, yeah. I think you and I would both agree that there's probably interchangeably like five different roster spots across the 53 man roster where it's like, 
oh, we're going to take an extra lineman. So that means we have one less of this. But really, there's only like five of these spots that you can move around because most of the roster is pretty much set in terms of the people that we're expecting to be there. Yeah, I, like, and this is where I find it interesting because I, when you, I look through it and we can kind of, you know, we talk about guys that can really move the needle here. Um, but let's start with, because we talked a lot about Darius Slayton and I do want to touch on him and the wide receiver room overall because I think that that can be a factor potentially here in this final preseason game. But the running back room, right? This is where you talk about, and, you know, I started to jot down where the numbers are at each position. How many players am I carrying on the offensive side? I came out on the offensive side being at 24 for a couple of very specific reasons, one of which being the half, the, the running back room, you're getting three guys. Like that's what's happening. And you mentioned about guys that guy that we liked in uh, Jay Sean Corbin. I think that he's going to the practice squad. That would be my assumption. And now it's about who is getting that. Now we could say second, or is it the third running back spot behind Saquon Barkley? And what feels like a coaching staff desire and also result of production for Antonio Williams, right? He seems to be the guy that's locked that in. So now it comes down to a Breida Brightwell situation where you can leave it up to the tape or does Matt Breida need to figure out why he can't get on the field and go show something with the way all these other running backs have looked? Well, we were talking about this pre-show and it, it, to me, it feels like Matt Breida and Darius Slayton are in relatively similar situations where whether you see them out there or not, it doesn't give me any indication of, of where they where they fit on this roster or like whether or not they're locked in. Like if Darius Slayton was not potentially going to be on the roster and then plays to like, and does well, does that change anything for him? The, you know, with Matt Breida, it's like, do the giants already feel confident knowing that he's a veteran? They've already seen a bunch from him that they don't need to see any work and they just want him ready for week one. Or if we see him out there, are they saying you need to show that you can fit this roster because we've seen Gary Brightwell on special teams. We've seen Antonio Williams. Like I, I, I just don't know what those guys can show or if it makes sense for them to them even be out there. I, so on the breed of front, I agree with you that I wonder if what happened for the Giants, and this is an instance of a, of a good thing, Gary Brightwell looked better than they anticipated, right? And they were like, oh, you know, we we, we got Matt Breida. He was our safety valve, and then we wanted to bring in Antonio Williams. We, we got Corbin in the building, and we kind of thought Brightwell, a holdover from a previous regime, maybe he's the guy that just kind of, you know, goes by the wayside, not going to carry four, whatever, practice squad, okay, great. And then Brightwell looks good. Now, he had a little bit of an injury concern, too. I think you're right. Like, I think – I don't think Matt Breida was doing anything good or bad for himself by playing or not playing. The question maybe becomes, did Brightwell show enough where you go, oh, he's younger, there's more upside, special teams, whatever, we're going to go with him. I don't think any decision gets made there. The Darius Slayton side of it, I also tend to agree. I want to make a little point just about him from a number standpoint. Uh, from the contract that we talked about all this offseason, a lot of people have talked about. But it's funny that when you see Alex Bachman have a really good game or when you hear that Sills is still over season after season trying to build that rapport with Daniel Jones and, and having a strong connection, those things wouldn't matter nearly as much if it was being said about Darius Hayden or if he was having a big game in a preseason either. These are back-end guys that are showing up, right? Alex Bachman, uh, 120 stars and 11 catches. Wow, right? Darius Slayton is already is already proven what he is at the NFL level. There's issues there, whatever, but he's shown it on Sundays in the NFL. These other guys have not. So I don't think that that, that barometer of, oh my God, you see what Darius Slate, you'd almost be saying, well, yeah, we know that he could do that. We've more been wondering, can he do it consistently? And that's something you probably learn enough of on the practice field in between these preseason games. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's tough because you hear about the rapport that David Sills has with Daniel Jones. You kind of want to scratch that itch a little bit more and see if, if it can come to fruition in game time. Obviously, all the reports out of training camp is the connection is great. I, we do come back to it, and this is something that we talk about all the time is like, you know, Darius Slayton ha you know, has had two years of over 700 receiving yards. That doesn't just grow on trees. That isn't, that isn't a seven-string wide receiver at the back end of your roster. That's a third or fourth wide receiver. That's a key contributor on many other teams. And it's just so hard. It's like, you know, because he had those bigger yardage numbers from a later round pick, his incentives went up to make his salary cap hit that much bigger. So like his own success might be the own demise that he has because of how much money the giants could save. And that's, and that's the tough part because Darius Slayton has the talent to be a, a number four NFL wide receiver on, on almost any team in this league. And, and that's where, when, when we talk more, 
I get worried about whether the talent of Darius Slayton is worth keeping around or, or is the cap savings of, you know, $1.8 million enough that the Giants desperately need in other areas. Yeah, and that's where that's I looked at when I was looking at these numbers. It's like, and we're talking about this room overall. Richie James at almost a million dollars. You got CJ Board in that same kind of area. You've got Alex Bachman making eight hundred twenty-five thousand. Sills making eight hundred twenty-five thousand. Like my thing when I come back to it is, we always talk about, oh, it's two point five million. And I'll reference you mentioned it last episode of, you know, this is a guy based on those numbers and Darius Slayton, uh, who you said someone that signed for three for thirty million, three years for thirty million. Um, on same type of stat lines, right? So this is a whatever seven to ten million dollar a year wide receiver, and now we're sitting here talking about yeah, but two point five million is just too much for it. And we understand it's the cap constraints that the Giants have and other areas that need to fill. But again, and I don't know where Sills falls into this category. Somebody on YouTube, you know, pointed out correctly. This is a guy that converted over from quarterback, so even though he's twenty six, he's you know learning the position on the fly in a lot of ways and, and certainly developing at a rapid rate, but if it's 900,000 here, 800,000, a million, and it's 2.5, well, again, as you make one cut, if you look over at it, now it's saying, well, we, we cut Bachman. So 800, 825,000. Now instead, the, the value, the cost point of Darius Slayton is effectively more like 1.7 million, right? Like that's too much. Like what, you know, and even 2.5, that's too much for a guy that's caught over 700 yards a season, has a season under his belt with eight touchdowns in it. And, as we've always talked about, if we're going to sit here and make the the excuses at times for what Daniel Jones has not had found him to be successful, well, how much better could Darius Slayton potentially play in the specific role they're going to have for him if there's a better offensive line and if Daniel Jones has more time and if you have Kadarius Tony and Wandell Robinson and Saquon Barkley, like he's going to be the afterthought out there on the field. And I'm not saying that any of these other guys couldn't also do it and serve that role. I just know that Darius Slayton has done it. And the only thing that really I think has changed the perception of him is the is the drops. A couple of high profile drops over the past season really made everyone go, oh boy. But by the way, most burner stretch the field wide receivers, they're not much over at 55 catch percentage because they're harder balls. These are contested opportunities. You're going for the big home run hit. He's done them where he's dropped them bread basket wide open. But I think that that's really skewed the perception of what this guy can be. Understanding. Fifth year, is he a part of the long term and everything that goes with that? Well, the other piece, though, Adam, is is what the Giants have told you by their drafts, though. Like, they spent a first-round pick on Kadarius Tony. They just spent— I know, but it's previous high... regime, though. You have to acknowledge that. Correct. They, they have just used a, a, a high draft capital on Wandale Robinson. They mm-hmm. did re-sign Sterling Shepard, and all indications look like he's going to be trying to get out there week one. Yep. And the Giants have to keep Kenny Galladay on the roster because they lose well, out four and a half million in cap space. So, like, even though you'd rather, if, if it was in a vacuum, you'd rather have Darius Slayton and be able to drop Kenny Galladay's contract. It's not feasible. Yes. So, some of the mistakes that have been made by previous regime, coupled with you know Wandell Robinson being there, yes. means that now all of a sudden Darius Slayton is the fourth now is the fifth wide receiver in your room making two and 2.6 million dollars and that's a big part of it too it's at a certain point you say well are you even going to be on the field right Right. and at that point then the money becomes more significant what uh, a couple quick things um uh, Kenny Galladay being signed by the previous regime as well. It's like, yes, we're stuck with him. And that could yeah, be literally in any, in any of these guys, right? Darius Slayton or otherwise, like we, we don't want to have to lose a guy. We think we could, it could be good. And maybe that's the cause to carry a seventh wide receiver here. Because again, Kenny Galladay is not a sixth guy on the list here, but we know that there's concerns there. Other quick thing though, man, sidebar, sidebar. Denzel Mims requested to be traded from the New York Jets. I posted up nobody there. I posted up on Twitter. I said straight up, Kenny Galladay for Denzel Mims. Jets got all the cap room in the world. He's a veteran. He, you know, he could be talented, whatever. Did we take a flyer? Take a flyer on Denzel Mims, who hasn't worked out, wants a fresh start underneath a new regime. Why not? Wouldn't you, you and you clear the money? You clear that you get off the money. You eat about four million in debt. You clear off 17 out the gate and the jets don't even care because they have the cap space to do it baby yeah but th- but i mean that would just be, it would be a disaster for the jets to do that when they spend a first round pick on garrett wilson they have Corey davis making 13 14 million a year they drafted elijah moore in the first round last year like 
Kenny Galladay doesn't solve their their Excuse problems me. at all. I was at talking all about either. solving my problem. Oh uh, yeah, I well, have a problem. What, what I what I what I was thinking instead. The counter argument is Mims for Slayton straight up. Who says I would, no? Yeah, I was gonna do that, but that like this is again. I guess it's like two teams that saying, hey, we don't really like what we have here. But but even Mims would be a, is a higher profile prospect than Darius Slayton was. You know what I mean? Like so, I don't know. I don't know if anybody would want that. Right? When both sides would go, yeah. What do we? You know, we'll just keep him. Like, and then it is what ends up happening. Anyway, there's a little bit of a goof there. Um, when we move through this, though, I said two tight ends uh, on the 53-man cut because another one will get added here. Like, it's going to be Bellinger and then name number two. I don't care. I think they're waiting for a veteran. Figure something out there that they're going to go with. And then offensive line, we didn't need to go really into this. I said nine because I think there's going to be movement. There's good, we got four bodies on there that could get shuffled, whatever. Let's see what happens. I'm not, you know... I'm not concerned about whether or not Revis makes the back end of this rotation. Yeah, I, uh, so I have a I have a question for you that's very high level as you're thinking about all all mm-hmm. these roster spots. Right. If you had to put a number today on how many people will be on the Giants 53 man roster that 53. are not on the roster oh, today, <laughs> how many would you pick? How many non roster players? Um, you know what I mean. Like they're either yeah, no, on another know, team yeah, or they're free agent yeah, or something right now. Um, boy. Optimistically, if I was looking, got to have at least uh, – I'm going to – I'll say like – I'll say – I'll say six. I'm going to say six. Maybe it should be seven. But I think six or seven because if you look at – we'll talk about it a little bit here. If you look at the linebacking room, you know you need at least one, maybe two bodies there. The cornerback room needs at least one, maybe two bodies there. The offensive line, like that's where it's a little bit interesting. Like, maybe you like these guys enough, you know, a Bredesen, a Garcia, a Revis, a Holden. Like, there's some questions you could ask there. Um, and then after that, like maybe something inside of the defensive front, you know. So it depends on how many bodies you want to bring in. But yeah, I think that eh, maybe maybe I think six. I think seven would almost be too high because you have to feel mostly good when you look across this roster. You know, where are you cutting a body out of the nose tackle, defensive tackle, defensive end room? No one's going there. You know, no one's going out of your your starting linebacker and some of your core guys there. So I can't really see a lot of movement here. Do you think it's a bigger number than that? I think it's a smaller number than that. I think it's, yeah, I I think it's closer to four. four. Yeah, like, I think yeah, clo- closer to four it. feels yeah. like the number because, yes, I think you, you and I both agree that the inside linebacker position needs some help. The cornerback position needs help. That's two. I would expect an offensive lineman potentially to come in as three. And, I, and I'm saying, like, because I, I – so to the point, it's like I'm almost saying like linebacker room. I'm like I could see two guys getting added in there potentially, and I could see two guys in the secondary potentially. Depends though, and it, and if I want to use the indication of keeping use of Corker around at least for right now and getting rid of a veteran, then you then you look at the young guys, a Darren Evans, and say, hey, for better or worse, you're going to be out, there, kid. You're going to be a part of this rotation. That shrinks the number. Well, it, yes, it does, and and so that's why I, you know, the fourth one that I have. So I have offensive line, linebacker, cornerback, and the last oh, and piece of end. it is is the tight end position. Yes, so yeah. like they, you know, they asked Brian Dable what they thought about his depth at tight end. He's like, we don't have any depth at tight end, so that just solves that Ooh. question. Next question, type thing. Boy. So the Giants are clearly <laughs> going to do that, but keep in mind, Adam, the other challenge is that the Giants don't have that much cap space to begin with, right? And so like players could get released if they're a veteran, they can go sign with someone else for more money than probably what the giants can offer. If they're a younger guy, yes, the giants can make the claim, but, but again, how many people are, are getting rid of young talent? That's cheap that the giants would immediately put on their 53 man roster. That's where the balance actually comes uh, into play. You know, it's interesting too. Cause like a guy like uh, Calitro is, a, is making over a million bucks right now, which I thought was interesting guys that they can clear that don't have any, uh, that wouldn't have any dead cap hit for them. And to your point, like they don't have a lot of money, but if some of these cuts are going to be coming here, you look down the back end towards that 53 area and Adams is off the books. That was a million dollars. Eric Smith would be a guy, 900,000 uh, Merrick at the tight end position, Harris in hand, who they just brought in, but this could just be innings eaters here. So they probably have like, you know, five, five million dollars to play with in terms of guys that may not be a part of it. And then you get into some other, you know, other players like Gary Brightwell, that's going to be another 825,000 and Moa and Bachman and Dorsey, like, you know, Quincy Roche, like it's funny, you know, depending on how you start to balance out, balance out this roster, every little dollar counts. We know that for the giants and they do have what about 5 million, I think in cap room as it currently stands right now. So, you know, you have 5.4 in cap space. You can probably negotiate yourself up to 10, but 
if you're looking at better players, <laughs> they're not going to cost you eight and nine hundred thousand dollars. They're going to cost you maybe you know a million. So it'll be interesting to see. And I think maybe you say small number, you know, four may be the number, but it could end up being two cuts and a signing. You know, it could just be like two cuts and one key guy, one guy to add to the secondary to feel more confident about what you can do there, or one key linebacker as we look at Sunday here and think about who are guys that can say no, 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 no. Go spend the cap room somewhere else. I can do this. Um, the first one comes to mind. And close out any thoughts you have on on as far as what they could do um, bringing in bodies. But the first one that comes to mind is that linebacker room and, and a guy like Carter Coughlin who feels primed to be able to put his best foot forward. And if not, we talk about guys, you know, yeah, you can't, you can't hurt yourself. I think he can help and hurt himself potentially if he's out there for this final game. Yeah. And, you know, Adam, uh, at the end of the day, oh, what I think – what I think about is what can we expect to see from Sunday or what should we be looking out for? And I think it really is some of the, the uh, a couple of intriguing positions. The two that come to my mind is the linebacking room with Tom and Fox is going to get quite a few more reps yeah, with yeah. No Darian Beavers this, uh, you know, for the rest of the season. You mentioned Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown. It feels like those are the types of players I'm going to be honing in on. And the last piece of it is the offensive line. We're going to see some of these backups who like Holden and others who showed during the other preseason game to be at least relatively competent. Like who's going to be out there for the offensive line that you're like, you know what, as a depth piece, that guy might be able to hold his own behind Izudu or Shane Lemieux or whomever out there. Yeah, it really is funny. And it's, if you bring that up because, and I this coming out of that last preseason game, Oh, the offensive line is decimated. Well, mostly it's just this one very specific position. We know a uh, Shane Lemieux, obviously dealt with that injury too, but the center position was really struggling. And if you think about it, they said they shuffled these guys, people getting thrown into roles they'd never played before in their careers, and they found a way to get through it. It wasn't perfect from a you know snap standpoint under center, but at the same time, the offensive line looked better than anyone anticipated when you got into those death pieces. So I'll be watching it, but maybe I'm almost watching it to say like, do we need to go and get another offensive lineman for sure here? You know, how far do we have to go here to make sure we feel confident in what we have across the front five and then from a depth piece. So maybe there's one move to be made there and there's two cuts coming out of that room, but that's a really good one to watch. I certainly like the linebacker room. And then, you know, the secondary I've been saying that I've quietly liked what I've been seeing from Darren Evans when he gets his reps out there. I think what will be fascinating in this game, unlike the first two where we kept saying every time the giants were going out there, it was our ones versus someone else's twos, right? It was never the uphill battle for anyone on our roster. On Sunday, maybe at the very least, we'll get even matchups here, right? Twos versus twos to start the game. So a guy like Darren Evans, you're going to get a, a better matchup and you'll be capable of showing if you can do it. Radarius Williams, is he even healthy now? Like we keep talking about him as being a part of the roster. You want to talk about a spot that's like up in the air? I don't know. He's listed behind both of the cornerbacks. Also don't know if he's going to be ready to play or not. Like those are the questions. I think secondary is one I'm really watching. I'll keep an eye for Yusuf Parker as well to see if he's trying to cement a position or if we look at him as being a guy that goes to practice squad. A um, lot of good stuff in there, friends. A lot of good stuff on a Friday. I feel like Andy had to do a pretty big lift here, trying to rein me in. I have more thoughts, more things I want to talk about. You're just um, passionate about the Giants. You're just passionate. Everyone can feel it, my friend. That's the way it goes, man. On a Friday, I just start to get really amped up. You go ahead and head over to YouTube. Get in on the comments. Let us know who are guys that you're watching for. Andy mentioned a guy like Fox. He's going to be out there to get reps. Calitro, right? There's these guys, man. I, I think they're on the chopping block. But we'll have to wait and see the wide receiver core, of course, among them. So let us know who you're going to be watching for on Sunday. Get the podcast fever, get those needs fulfilled. And until next time, when we come back in, we'll be giving our definitive 53-man roster on Monday ahead of the Tuesday cutdown. Until then, as Andy Makowitz wants, needs, and nay, demands the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue. 